On May 6th, when this video comes out, the country that I live in will be crowning a new monarch. He will also be crowned the monarch of 14 other countries. If you're not from those 14 countries or the 29 others that have a monarchy, that might seem a little odd to you. Of course, if you're like me in the UK, you might also find that a little odd. Monarchies are not a common form of government in the 21st century. Most countries, either through revolution or reform, have moved away from hereditary monarchs. Yes, there are still political dynasties like the Clintons and the Kennedys in America, and there are forms of government that have a republican shape to them, their leader might be a president, but power is so consolidated that they effectively act as a monarch, or there are indeed countries where they nominally are republics, but the same family has been at the top of that republic for its whole existence. All of this left me wondering, who died and made this inbred sausage-fingered man king? I mean, I know it was literally his mum, right? Like, that's obviously the answer to the question. But I wanted to think a little bit more about where the monarchy comes from, why do we still have it, and whether we should even bother having a monarchy anymore. Should we, in fact, be Republicans? Not the, not the American kind. <laughs> I'll also be reflecting in this video on the history of Republicanism in the UK, both in the slightly more distant past and a bit more recently, and where in the more recent past we've been getting it wrong, not because the monarchy is exceedingly popular or a particular monarch was exceedingly popular, though that might well have been the case for one of them, but because we're not making our case forcefully enough when we're actually confronted with the institution and the damage it's doing to the country. So that's what we're doing. A whole lot of history, a little bit of modern day, and me on location, in a costume, in several costumes in fact, having a good time. What more could you want? But before we carry on, if you like this kind of video, where we're in costumes and we're on location. Remember to like and subscribe, that's the best way to get me to do more of these. And I guess, let's get started with it. Where does the monarchy come from? So, let's speak plainly from monarch to subject. Why do you have to do what I say? Well, the truth is that monarchy as a system of government long predates the type of king that I am, which is a medieval European king. There is this fantastic line in the Bill Wirtz video, The Entire History of the World, I guess, that goes like this. Look at this. I control the food now. Now everyone will want to be my friend and live near me. Let's all build houses, except mine is bigger because I own the food. Which is a gross oversimplification, but it does neatly illustrate the idea of social hierarchies. And to be fair, it is just a fun little YouTube video like this one, so I'm not going to be a royal pain about it. The thing about social hierarchies, and this is just me expressing a thought about it, is that they've probably existed since we've been roaming around the earth in extended family groups, but once you become a sedentary society, or a society that deals with surpluses in resources, then these structures tend to become formalised. Monarchies have existed in some form since, as far as I can tell, around 3100 BC. Now, they may have existed before then, we know of permanent settlements that have existed that predate that, and maybe they were a series of Stone Age anarchist communes. I'd kind of love it to be the case, and maybe it was, but for our purposes, Pharaonama is probably going to be our starting point, or his excellently named predecessors from the pre-dynastic period, with fantastic names like, and I promise you I'm not making this up, Double Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just understand, now that I've recovered from the fit of laughter I had about Double Falcon, um, that I'm mainly saying that because I find the name Double Falcon intensely cool and wish I was named Double Falcon. But who made the Pharaoh the Pharaoh? Well, a lot of things. The ability to command people to do violence on his behalf? Probably yes. Um, priests? You know, 
uh, religious legitimacy factored into the pharaoh's legitimacy as well. In fact, they were often regarded as god kings, if you like. And the other question, which is, what are you going to do if you live in a place without a king? So let's take this bit by bit. Why does it matter that the pharaoh is able to compel people to do violence on his behalf to preserve his power? Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. Mmm. Oh, uh, sorry, you just caught me admiring this bit of tree that I make them keep here, presumably because I enjoy it for some reason. Violence to preserve political power isn't something that's alien to the societies that we live in today. And you will note that a lot of those societies are republican, or at least non-monarchical. But absolute rulers have a bit of a problem, as French President Emmanuel Macron discovered because he is doing his very best impression of an absolute monarch. And it's this, when things go wrong, people only really have one person to blame for things going wrong. And in the ancient world, when things went wrong, they didn't just go out and protest with twee signs and, you know, do stuff like that. They would break into the king's house and beat him to death. Now, in that case, it might be a good idea to have a goon squad, if you will, who stops the people from breaking into your house and murdering you in your sleep. It sounds quite useful, doesn't it? And we might even give them a fancy name, like the Royal Guard, for example. So how do priests factor into all of this? Well, we'll talk a bit later about the post-Christian Western European ideas about how divine right factors into monarchical legitimacy. But in ancient societies, particularly early ancient societies, you're dealing with a lot of new things, surpluses of grain, or copper, or things like commerce. And where there's commerce, there's laws that dictate how commerce should happen. And you need people to enforce those laws, to pass judgment. And in a lot of these societies, priests did that. So they would lend their legitimacy as religious figures to demonstrate that the gods were with the king by, by passing judgment on the people who broke the king's laws. Priests often fulfilled this role in ancient societies, and in lending their legitimacy to the king, and I use the word lending advisedly, they would sort of provide a guarantee, if you like, that as long as you obeyed the king, the crops would grow at the right time, the rivers would flood at the right time, and everything would be fine because the priests commune on your behalf with the various gods. And should the floods not come on time or the crops fail, well, it's the king's fault, isn't it? It's not your fault, you're the priest. The king is the one with the real power. And holding that position, incidentally, created rival power bases to the king. So even the absolute monarchs of old, they couldn't really have it all. This is kind of similar to the idea of the Mandate of Heaven in China, where an unworthy king would bring about ruin, or emperor, as the case may be, and they would bring about ruin. And their overthrow would be completely justified because they had lost the Mandate of Heaven. The crops weren't growing, there was too much war, there's famine, pestilence, whatever you like. And so you can overthrow them. We're not even halfway through the first section of the video, and we've already got a monarch being overthrown, which is a good sign for the video, I think, if not for me personally. Now we come to the issue of how are you going to survive away from him? Throughout human history, one rule has always applied. If it's shit, hit the bricks. You can just leave. And sure, in ancient societies, that might have worked well if you were a pastoral nomad or a hunter-gatherer. If the seasons change, or the animals that you hunt migrate, you can just follow them. But in settled agricultural societies, that becomes a little bit more complicated. Because what happens in settled agricultural societies is labour is specialised. You might become a brickmaker, or a copper salesman, or a tax inspector. And leaving the comfort of unsettled society is quite a challenge. 
Think about it like this. If you were to take a tax inspector and drop them into the middle of the Bronze Age wilderness, what would they do? They would probably die, right? So why risk it? You have a good thing under the king or pharaoh. The gods seem to have blessed him. So what's wrong with that? Well, we'll come to that when we reach the next section and I'm out of this royal garb. But for now, that gives us a nice a nice easy transition to talk about the monarchy that is going to be in all of the papers on everyone's mind on the day of the release of this video that is the british monarchy picking a starting point for when the british monarchy began or even the institutions that it inherits from is i guess we could call it controversial and a lot of people will put it if we're talking about england at the start of the reign of one of the more interesting characters from the TV show Vikings, Alfred the Great. <laughs> Smooth. So if we're talking about England, and I do feel kind of sad that I have to talk about it, but every day I do wake up in it. So here we are. Didn't Alfred the Great found it? And didn't the Saxons, Angles, Utes and Frisians bring over a lot of the institutions that the current monarchy inherits from? And didn't they also bring over a lot of the foundations for the institutions that make up our current arrangement today? Such as the, uh, I'm going to have to give it a go, the Tanagamot? <laughs> um, I, look, look, I'm not a Saxon coming over. It's, it just wasn't going to happen. But the, thankfully, there is a shorter form of it, which is the Witan, or Vitan. I'm not sure how they would have said it, but the Witan, which was an assembly of noblemen who would, among other things, elect the king. A thing we notoriously do not do anymore, which is a bit, perhaps, part of the problem. The Witan would also be summoned by the king at his will. And it had a lot of powers that ebbed and flowed as time went on because codified constitutional arrangements are not a thing that we have now in the UK, really. Not, not in the way that a lot of other countries have. So do you think a bunch of migrating pagans from Denmark and Germany were going to produce a better defined system than what we have now? Of course not. Those of you who are more interested in the history, though, may like to know that the Witan did vote on laws presented by the king. And that is an interesting distribution of power because that implies they can say no to the king. Not that that seems like a good idea a lot of the time, but they could. It's important at this point to mention that while this arrangement might sound like the early arrangements with the British Parliament, um, we shouldn't get mixed up in that way. The Witan had very, very different responsibilities and powers to even the very early English Parliament. For example, the Witan was directly accountable to the king. Yes, it had power, like I said, it could conceivably say no to the king. Not that it did very often. But the idea of the Witan convening without the consent of the king would be considered treason, potentially, at times. So we're not really talking about a serious independent legislative body in the way that we might imagine a parliament to be. So when does the British slash English monarchy start? Most people would probably say, and this is a product of the education system, that it begins with William the Conqueror and his Norman conquest of 1066. And they don't just say that because, you know, there was an epic three-way battle for the throne of England a place that the Romans considered so deeply cursed that nothing good could ever come from it. So of course, the three contenders were a Saxon, a Norman, and a Norwegian person, which really is a supremely cursed trio, but there it is. But the real reason people say this is because Norman rule over England changed England. It changed the ruling class. It changed the language spoken in its court. It changed England's positioning in European politics. It also led to a ton of castles being built all over the place. And people, they love castles. Just as an aside, if you have a Norman surname, you are more likely, if you live in the UK, to go to university. No commentary there. It was just a fun fact. So, 
Going from William the Conqueror to Charlie Sausage Fingers is a journey that takes almost a thousand years and is exhausting, let's put it that way. But most of the history is uninterrupted monarchy and that's going to be kind of important to some of the arguments we make later, so just bear with me. Remember when I asked who died and made him king? Well, I'm a monarch, so who died and made me so? Well, my father. And my father's father died so that he could become king. And my father's father's father was the cousin of the king who he overthrew with the help of a foreign king and a group of disloyal nobles. Oh, don't look at me like that, like none of your ancestors ever did a little bit of light treason. But this does pose quite a problem, because the monarchy in the UK is regarded as something of a stabilising force. And while that has been the case, perhaps, with the previous monarch who died and made the sausage-fingered inbred dickhead king, um, <laughs> It has not always been the case. We have had quite a lot of strife related to royal families, not just foreign usurpations and civil wars, but strifes within specific royal houses. In fact, our most famous incident of this was the War of the Roses, which involved two houses that were ultimately descended from the same person because our royal family and nobility are inbred as fuck. I mean, not as inbred as the Ptolemies in Egypt, but once the Habsburgs got involved in Europe, I mean, it wasn't that far removed. So our starting point is arguably a foreign ruler who usurped the throne and who incidentally overruled the king chosen by the Witan, which perhaps goes to show how much practical power it actually had. And let me tell you as a veteran Crusader Kings 2 and Crusader Kings 3 player, that the fact that a Norwegian man called Harald Hadrada decided that because he could he would claim the throne of England, it may have meant that the Wutan's choice was a little doomed from the start. Ah yes, there's there it is. Ah. So we have a lot of power concentrated in the hands of a monarch, particularly in the time period that we were just talking about, and one of the things that you have to do when you have a lot of power is you have to justify having that power. And how do you do that, right? Sure, you can say, uh, my armies will show up and they will ravage your lands if you don't acknowledge my supremacy. And lots of kings have done that. The thing about armies is they're expensive, right? I have to feed the men who show up, and in the case of a medieval monarch such as myself, a lot of my men come from vassals who may not be particularly keen on lending me all of their men, especially because a lot of those men are just farmers. And look, to be honest, you want farmers to do farming, otherwise you do not have food. And if people don't have food, that causes me to have some of the problems that we might have talked about with those ancient kings and people beating them to death. So let's avoid that. What's your justification then if you're a monarch who wants people to, if not enthusiastically support your rule, then at least reluctantly accept it? Remember earlier when I was talking about priests and when I was talking about my dad and his dad and so on dying, well, when I was talking about my dad and his dad and all that, all I ever answered in that was who died. I never answered the question of who made me king. Yes, today the British monarchy, and indeed almost all monarchies that still exist today, the succession is mediated by legal mechanisms. So it is quite literally the death of the previous monarch that makes them king. Back in my day though, not so much. Of course, there was always the risk of a papal-backed bastard coming over and taking all of your daddy's stuff from you. And yeah, one of the ways that you would avoid that happening is to get the Pope's representative to crown you, usually an archbishop. Or if you were very lucky, you would get the Pope, but I hear he only reserves that for emperors, so 
I'm kind of shit out of luck on that front. This crowning by a representative of the Pope represented the idea of the divine right of kings, and that is quite a big idea, and it's kind of controversial to try and single, single it down into like one big definition, but for our purposes, this is the one that we'll be working from. The divine right of kings is a doctrine that asserts that the king was preordained by God to inherit the crown, and is thus not accountable to any earthly authority in the exercise of their power. Thus, any attempt to hold the king accountable, or to resist their rule, may be considered a sacrilege. In societies where religion played a bigger role, this is a pretty powerful justification for your rule. You might also know about similar concepts. For example, in Islam, you might be familiar with the idea of a caliph, that is, a religious and political successor to the Prophet Muhammad. While caliphs were overthrown, or their power subordinated to other secular rulers, such as the time when the caliph was a vassal to the Seljuk emperors, it still worked quite well, I suspect, to quell some discontent. This idea of divine right is represented in some monarch's title. If we look at Charles III's full title, His Majesty Charles III, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. You'll see by the grace of God among those titles, and that represents this anointing by God. In fact, this anointing is quite literal, because the coronation ceremony of the British monarch that will be happening on the day that this video is out involves an oil called chrism. Yeah, I know. I, it's one of those things that makes me wonder whether the UK is a real place, and yet every day I wake up here. The powers of the monarchy in the 1000 years that have passed since the Norman Conquest have waxed and waned over that time, usually dependent on its relationship with other centres of power in the Kingdom of England, or after the Act of Union, the UK. And it often depended on how competent the king was, or how powerful he was, or how much money he had, which is an obvious substitute for how much power he has. And I know some of you will be jumping up and down in the comments and saying, is, is, are they going to talk about Magna Carta? Uh, or they're going to be out there set to, wondering whether I'm talking about Charles I, who's the lack of power may well have led to the formation of the Commonwealth, which, it, no, is not the Commonwealth currently headed by Charles, the one who's getting coronated soon. That actually raises an important question. Let's suppose that I am a good monarch. And I don't, and I don't just mean good in the sense that I do legal reforms, or I found universities, or I just generally don't mistreat people who are under my rule. Let's suppose that I'm good at navigating the politics of the realm and am able to effectively manage the different centres of power that could compete with me. That's arguably a good thing for the place that I rule. A peaceful land, a quiet people is generally quite a good motto for rulers to follow. But what if my son or daughter, as the case may be, isn't so good? What if they're just generally given to cruelty, or incompetence, or just plunge themselves into hideous amounts of debt because, you know, parties in the royal palace can be fun? Or even what if they're just severely mediocre, as most monarchs are? That question of not having control over the quality of the person who rules you is actually kind of an important one, and it's arguably one that's going to play quite a prominent role in the next section of this video. And it's actually quite a big factor in how we ended up with the current arrangement that we have, the constitutional monarchy that we enjoy, if you like, today in Britain. The powers of the monarchy, as I've said, has changed over time. And it's easy for us sitting here in 2023 to think of it as kind of like a slow decline to a position that we're now in, where we have constitutional monarchy. But it quite violently went up and down and up and down at various points, and yes, it was often accompanied by quite a lot of violence when this happened. While the monarch has a lot of power, of course, they can't do everything, right? I mean, if your kingdom is just ten houses, then yeah, I guess you could literally do everything as monarch. 
but there's a reason the Republic of Dave in Fallout 3 works. It's because it's a very, very small number of households, right? But in a real kingdom, in a real country, you have to delegate power as a king. And this will often take the form as literally giving them land to govern in your name. And the thing is, while someone you give land to might be, you know, personally loyal to you or conceptually loyal to the idea of the kingdom or just their place in the world, there's an interesting question. What if their kids are politically competent or are just assholes who don't like you? If they're assholes who don't like you or are politically competent, you have another task on your hand, which is that you need to keep them happy. And part of the task of keeping them happy is giving them power, giving your power away so that you don't get overthrown and you still get to wear your nice cloaks and your fancy necklaces and all of the nice stuff that you have on you at the moment. And the thing is, this doesn't just apply to hereditary nobles. Over time, this began to apply to a burgeoning mercantile class or even eventually capitalists. And in England, these people managed to get some form of actual legislative power almost, in the form of the Parliament. Now, while England wasn't unique in having a Parliament, I mean, Scotland and Ireland also had a Parliament. Um, assemblies of this sort existed throughout the world at various points. It does do something quite interesting when you concede to having a Parliament, which is that it gives the powerful a nice time and a nice opportunity to mingle with each other without necessarily having the king there. If you know your English history well, your mind will probably immediately go to King John, who was known as Lackland, uh, which in fairness is a name that was pretty earned, although actually it was maybe a little unfair in its origin, but he lived up to it or lived down to it, depending on how you feel about that sort of thing. Or you might be thinking of another king, one that we'll be talking about in the next section, who really bungled it in a way that almost no English monarch has ever bungled it, which is kind of a shame from my perspective, but what can you do? But the point is that kings can find themselves in difficulty, either politically, financially, or just by being terrible at the job, such that it is a job at all. The monarchy has generally seen its power curtailed over time. And in fact, the, um, the tyrannical exercise of power in the case of one particular king led to them getting executed in England, which when you think about what English people are like now is kind of wild. But that leads to an interesting question now, which is why do we still have a monarchy? Well, monarchies are a bit like weeds. You need to get them out at the roots and unfortunately or fortunately depending on how you feel about it we did not root it out in that way and i mean you can just ask the french they have something like free people pretending to be the king of their country when they have been a republic at least four times i mean you you can see how much these people really really stick to their guns that they deserve to just rule over you especially incompetent monarchs have had power sharing forced onto them but clever monarchs often embraced the idea of power sharing because they would look at examples like the time England executed their king and say, do I want that to happen to me? Generally speaking, the answer was no, unless it was part of some very bizarre way of getting pleasure right at the end of your life. Especially monarchs in a particular time period, they would embrace the idea of power sharing because why go through the hassle of having to exercise hard power to enforce your rule when you can just have really nice soft power do it for you why not settle for soft power entrenching you in your incredibly privileged position rather than hard power well we'll get to that in a little bit but this question and the answer that was given is why we have our current absurd position in the uk if you take the monarchists at their word, what we have at the moment is an extravagantly dressed head of state who wields no formal power, who uses no undue influence, who is apparently superior to an elected leader because why, right? That's probably where it falls apart for most people, but 
That is nonetheless the argument they made, and we will get to why they think like this a bit later on. I've mentioned it a little already, but if the quality of a monarch is essentially up to random chance, then why do we have them? This isn't a new question. It's a question that's been asked since we've had monarchies and since we've had bad kings. So why do we have them? And what did we do in England when we decided the answer was we don't really need them at all? Republicanism, the cure for monarchies. <sighs> Hello, yeah, I've dropped about eight social classes in a single costume change. I am but a humble person who wants the social order to be one of equality between all men. A level society, if you will, though I suspect we'll be getting into that once I've set you all up with some background. Let's return to the question the much better dressed fellow asked in the last section. Why shouldn't we have a king or why should we have a king? There are many reasons why we shouldn't, but I think they asked the wrong question. When I hear about the opulence and the wealth of my so-called betters, I think about high food prices, having a back-breaking job, and having no real say in the things that make my life so bad. I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same. But the need to be rid of the king is settled in my mind. What do we replace the king with? The more radical among you might say, why replace him at all? Why have leaders at all? And that's fair. But for my more moderate and, if we're taking the spirit of the costume a bit more literally, my more likely to affect their vision of society contemporaries, there needs to be someone at the top, a chief executive, a consul, a lord protector. None of these things are kings, and none of these necessarily have to be hereditary positions, though, as was said earlier in the video, political dynasties are a thing in republics, and even ones we commonly regard as democratic. So before we dig into the details of where republics emerged from in the ancient past, let's define our term. A republic is a state or government where power rests with representatives of the people, as defined by the state or government, and where the head of state is specifically not a monarch. So that definition would exclude, as an example, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where the Zlachta, that is the nobility, would meet in the same, which is their parliament, to elect a king. Just because there's a democratic element to a system of government doesn't mean it's not a monarchy. And similarly, just because there's an autocratic system in place doesn't mean that it's not a republic. We also need to be aware of that term, the people, because for most of Republican history, that's meant, if not outright exclusion of poor people or non-citizens or women and so on, there's at least been an element of gerrymandering certain electorates so that certain classes retain particular influence. Think of ancient Rome and its elections for positions like Quaestor, where the electorate would be tilted towards aristocrats as opposed to positions like Tribune of the Plebs, which would be much more fair, at least as we'd see it today. That's why you had the spectacle of a patrician called Clodius being adopted by a man younger than himself so that he could be a pleb and become their tribune because the aristocrats hated him for being a scandal-prone, rabble-rousing populist who also caused a lot of street violence. Let's spend a bit more time in Rome, because the founding myth, or at least what I'd consider a myth, of their republican system of government perhaps answers the question of when is it okay to overthrow the monarchy. We can't go into the whole story, because frankly, like a lot of Roman stories, it takes forever to get through, and also has content that I'm not just going to throw at you without warning. So let's meet our main character, the last king of Rome, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, or Tarquin the Proud, if you like. He was probably some kind of Etruscan who was confirmed by the Senate of Rome to be their seventh king. He reigned for 25 years, and while the specific details of his reign are a mix of legend, myth, and vague fact, uh, a lot of which are used to justify Rome's republican form of government, uh, and also a general fear of tyrants, which is why Caesar met with the fate he did. 
Tarquin was quite a big builder. Um, he built Rome's most famous sewer, the Senate House. I'm kidding. He actually did build a sewer, which was called the Cloaca Maxima, which is just the best name. But this issue of constant building at the behest of a king did something. It pissed the people of Rome off. The <laughs> this combined with putting senators to death wasn't really a sign that they were dealing with a reasonable person who would have their powers limited. He would rule on capital offences without consulting his counsellors. He worked to diminish the power of the Roman Senate, which during the time of the kings wasn't exactly the strongest legislature we could imagine, and was generally a tyrant who allowed his soldiers, who didn't really have much in the way of warring to do after he defeated his many enemies, they just sat around drinking all day, which, if you know soldiers of the ancient world, probably isn't going to end well. Tarquin found himself driven out by the head of his bodyguard, a fellow by the name of Brutus. You could say that the name just inspires treason in the people who have it. Then Rome reformed itself into the noble, free republic they knew and loved back then. Not ruled by a king, but by a pair of elected consuls, who held the power of veto over each other and could only serve for a single year, and the Senate that had to approve the laws that the consul put forward. Before any Rome nerds get into it with me, I know that this is an oversimplification, but I'm just a humble peasant farmer right now, so just like, leave me alone, okay? Leave me alone. <laughs> Rome wasn't the only state that became a republic, either through violent overthrow of their king or just a change of tradition. You could include places throughout history and the world, like Carthage, Athens, Venice, Dithmarschen, San Marino, Gotland, the Taifa of Cordoba. In ancient India, there are some republics that are attested to, and in pre-Columbian America too, we find republics. These Forms of government have existed all over the place, in all sorts of forms, at basically all times. As far as current evidence suggests, the oldest republics haven't been around as long as monarchies, but they have been a fact of life for people throughout our history. Though, there's a reason I picked on Rome, and perhaps listed with a lot of bias towards Europe. It's not just that I'm the worst kind of Eurocentric thinker, it's that it's directly relevant to the story of republicanism I want to tell. Think of Constantinople and Mehmet the Conqueror's glorious victory over the rump Byzantine state. A lot of people crudely mark this as the beginning of the Renaissance, or at least the end of the medieval period. The common perception is that this was the catalyst for a bunch of scholars who had access to sources that Western Europeans didn't they made their way westwards and spread these ancient lost ideas. It's a nice thought, but the fact that a lot of people credited as Renaissance thinkers and philosophers died before Mehmet the Conqueror lived up to his name and conquered Constantinople, it's probably not quite what happened. But the ideas that were sparked by these thinkers absolutely had an impact. A lot of English radicals, who thought a bit more seriously about what a post-monarchy UK would look like, were radical Protestants. Which, if you think about who republicanism is commonly associated with, at least at the basic word level, might be a little bit surprising. I guess that means Henry VIII, by wanting to divorce his wife super badly, making himself supreme ruler of the Church of England, and actually strengthening the monarchy beyond the powers it had, even before he split from the Catholic Church, may have sowed the seeds for its temporary destruction in more ways than one. Let's talk about that temporary destruction, shall we? Perhaps fittingly, it was a King Charles who brought this about, but it wasn't our current Charles yet. Charles I was something of an autocrat. See, the English Parliament of the time would be summoned and dismissed at the request of the king, quite literally on his whim. But when they were summoned, they would pass acts, and in particular at this time, the king couldn't raise taxes without the consent of the English parliament. This was during a period known as the Wars of the Free Kingdoms, and no, I don't mean the very cool one with Sao Sao and so on. The king basically fucked it big time. First, with the Scottish over-religious reforms, and 
As a result of those religious reforms, the Scottish came and took a bunch of land south of the border, which, given the state of the UK today, might be requested by some. This forced the king into a bind, because he needs money to kick the Scottish out. So where does he turn to? To Parliament, of course, because those are the people who control the money factory. Under normal circumstances, the Parliament might not be delighted to do this, but they'd more or less do it with a bit of back and forth. The thing about Charles was, he fancied himself an absolute monarch, and didn't govern with his Parliament. Keeping it dismissed for 11 years, so the Parliament would give him taxes, sure, but they weren't just going to rubber stamp it. They decided to go through all of their various beefs with Charles, and his attempts at personal rule, which wasn't what Charles wanted, so after a short period of time, he dismissed them, hence the name for this parliament being the Short Parliament. It turns out, though, that he continued to lose to the Scottish, and losing is expensive, so he was forced to call another parliament, and this one made sure that it wasn't going to be dismissed in three weeks like the previous one and passed an act of parliament saying it could only be dismissed with its consent. That issue resolved, the parliament then decided to present the king with the Great Remonstrance, which was basically a list of reasons why Charles sucked. You might imagine he didn't take this very well, and after a series of disputes, parliament confiscated his control of the army. Do you think a person who tried to rule alone would take that lying down? Well, Charles didn't. He went to the city where we're recording today, uh, to the city of Nottingham, where he raised his royal standard above his own army and declared war on his own parliament. A parliament that had begun to contain some quite radical thinkers, such as the Levellers, who might have seen such an act as declaring war on his own people. I don't have time to go through the intricacies of the Civil War, but to cut a long story short, Charles lost basically every battle, and ended up being captured by the Scottish, who then ransomed him off to the Parliament, who had this great fiasco of a trial where they had to justify how they could charge a king with a crime, particularly treason. I won't go into all the details of it, but I'm going to throw up a link somewhere around here to a Historia Civilis video about that trial, because oh my god was it a shit show. The main points to take away, for our purposes, are that they decided that a king declaring war upon his own people was treason, which may not seem like such a radical idea to us now, but back then was explosive, given that treason meant doing harm to the king, or if you like, the sovereign entity of a country, giving hints at things like popular sovereignty, though to be clear, this isn't quite that, don't get it mixed up. The second main point is that they executed the king and established a pseudo-republic, which in practice did look a lot like a monarchy, but based on our definitions, wasn't. Now, I'm not going to say that there are direct lessons we can apply today, mainly because I doubt that we'll see Charlie Sausage Fingers raise his royal standard over Nottingham, but it is interesting how little a lot of us know about this period. The Protectorate, as it was known, was a bit of a fiasco itself, and was led by the Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell, who was actually offered the crown at one point, perhaps telling you how committed to republicanism the people around this project actually were. The Irish didn't particularly like English kings, or their direct rule over Ireland, and there was a fourth side to this civil war that was going on at the time, Confederate Ireland which should not be taken to mean that kind of confederate. They were Catholics who were simply trying to establish more rights for themselves and to reduce the power of the minority of Protestants who for some reason that we cannot possibly discern had a majority in the Irish House of Commons. They continued to fight after the King's execution and Cromwell committed atrocities in Ireland. It wouldn't be the last time the English would do that, but Cromwell was a butcher. Through a combination of battle, slaughter, and induced famine, and gee, I wonder if that might become a theme, Ireland was significantly depopulated. Not a great start for our republican tradition. The Protectorate also engaged 
in great big expensive foreign wars with the Dutch and the Spanish, which you'll recall Parliament needs to fund because that was still the rule at the time. And the New Model Army, a professional military that had been established during the Civil War, was quite expensive, which meant that the tax burden was, let's call it burdensome for the purposes of this video. These wars led to the colonial acquisition of Jamaica and a treaty with the Dutch that's not especially interesting for this video, beyond the fact that once its secret clauses were revealed, that it precipitated a political crisis in the Dutch Republic, which probably ended their Republican experiment as well. The domestic side of it wasn't much better. The long parliament was purged before Charles I's trial by the New Model Army, who Cromwell was a member of. And the thing about professional armies is that they don't tend to voluntarily disband, and they like to wield political power, which made the protectorate look more like a military dictatorship, or perhaps a monarchy, than a republic. This wasn't an accident. Cromwell wasn't a radical dissenter like the levellers or diggers, who advocated for a variety of ideas between them, ranging from popular sovereignty, universal suffrage, well, for men over 20, and generally wanted to see a more equal or level social order. The diggers were the more radical wing who took this a step further to ideas like common ownership and the idea that people should be able to farm the land freely to feed themselves under that model of ownership. Sounds almost socialist in a way. And people do categorize them as agrarian socialists. I'm not here to argue with that, but I will say that these were often quite what we'll call traditional people in certain ways. So this shouldn't be taken as an endorsement of every single thing these people believed, but for the time, they were very radical and interesting. Arguably Cromwell's failure to embrace some of these more radical ideas doomed the protectorate, but also the country wasn't exactly particularly stable, and Cromwell managed to alienate everyone before his son took over after his death. Sounds like something else to me. And the king was restored. All of that strife, all of that death, and what was it for? We ended up with Charles II and the execution of the people who signed his father's death warrant. In a way, you could say this is a case of England doing something a little too early and then bungling it because it just wasn't the right time with the right conditions. But there's a lot of interesting things about this experiment, like how committed to Republican ideals do you need to be to make it stick? The protectorate sure looked like a monarchy when it was put into practice, and this goes to the separation of the term democracy from republic, and maybe makes you think about whether certain republics are worthy of the term. Even so, most of the world is now governed by republics, and a lot of paths were walked to make that the case. But there are generally a couple of ways that you get there either in chaos induced by some kind of calamity, like China's century of humiliation, or the conditions that precipitated the French revolutions. You might also be a settler colony of a European superpower and just want to elect your king and call them a president before you start manifesting your destiny, which when you consider the outcome there makes me wonder how useful some forms of republicanism actually are. Crucially, I'm talking about the good kind of republicanism, so don't worry about it. At least not until my inevitable follow-up where I explain how shit America is. My rambling aside, this raises a question. If the British experiment in republicanism wasn't so great, and that republics don't mean that your rights are necessarily respected, or that you have democratic control over your lives and government, I mean, such that you can under capitalism anyway, why do I care who sits at the top of that system? Why should we care? Why we should be Republican now? 
There are a lot of people who identify as Republicans. A lot of them are your usual, very online, pseudo-media personality who's a leftist. But we have an official campaign for the establishment of a republic, and we've even had members of parliament who are Republicans. Not just recently, but actually quite far back. And this might be surprising to you, because being a Republican is technically illegal, which makes it very cool. Before anyone worries about me, this law is never enforced, at least not through that law. I want to use the very first part of this video to complain a little bit though. Very British of me, I know. I want to use the first part of this video to complain a little bit. Very British of me, I know. But if you aren't keen on republicanism or the republican movement, I can't actually blame you. They generally don't seem very secure in their ideas, which I find interesting because their ideas are hypothetically my ideas. Maybe with a few specifics here and there that are different, but I feel very secure in my ideas, hence the video. Let's talk about those responses and why they bothered me. I'll be going through three categories of them. The first will be an organisation that officially advocates for the formation of a republic. The second will be a popular-ish left media personality, and the third will be another YouTuber. But this is not a drama video, and I will link to his video down below so you can watch the whole thing, because I don't really have a problem with most of it, it's just a specific bit, as we'll see. Let's start with our Advocates for a Republic. The most prominent campaigning group that advocates for a republic in the UK is, conveniently, a group called Republic. If you've not heard of them, well, we might be about to see why. Let's have a look at their response to the Queen's death, which, given that she was an incredibly long reigning and by all accounts popular monarch, is kind of important. We are saddened to hear the news of the Queen's death and we wish to express our condolences to the royal family. There will be plenty of time to debate the monarchy's future. For now, we must respect the family's personal loss and allow them and others to mourn the loss of a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. So what's wrong with this? Well, on the face of it, nothing. There should be nothing wrong with a polite expression of condolences. I think it's perfectly possible for you to say, this person was the head of and personally identified with an institution with which we strongly disagree, but I guess for her family, it's really sad. So there's a genre of response that we get whenever a major event happens, which goes along the lines of now is not the time, which obviously invites the question, when is the time? And if you're a serious campaigning organization, the time is when the issue is most salient. So for example, if you were an organization who advocated against people chugging gallons of horseradish and blowing out their digestive tract, the time when you would campaign strongest on that issue is after a very public incidence of that happening. So this response, even though I understand why they did it, is to me a sign that you're not necessarily a serious campaigning organization. I mean, I understand why they did it, as I say. They want to appeal to a particular type of person. It's a lot like those people who make being sensible the core fact of their politics. They don't want to be associated with those people. And in this case, those people might be people like me who say things like, fuck the king. But that poses a different question. Are you a serious campaigning organization that wants the establishment of a republic or not. If you do, you can't really be afraid of what people who will never be convinced to your side of the argument think of you. And all of this leads us on to our second category of person, the person who always comes up whenever we need a bad take. It is Navarra Media's Aaron Bastani. Queen Elizabeth embodied the idea of the British nation for millions of people a nation that rebuilt itself after war and left behind an empire. It's extraordinary to think how much stability she provided during such immense changes. Of course her passing is momentous and historic. A century ago, her ancestors ruled over the British Empire. It covered 25% of the planet. A British nation emerged from that. A surprisingly stable one. 
and it almost all happened under the rule of a single monarch. Astonishing, really. You might be looking at that and wondering, well, is he wrong? And to be honest, if you consider Northern Ireland part of this mythical British nation, then yes, I don't think there was a terribly massive amount of stability in this particular case. And um, it's just kind of weird for a Republican, as I assume he is, to praise a monarch in a factually dubious way as this is. It also lends credence to this particularly false and pretty malicious narrative that's set by monarchists, which goes something like this. That the Queen was a selfless, uh, supremely talented public servant who worked tirelessly to ensure that Britain remained great or could manage its decline in an acceptable way, but also was simultaneously completely inert and didn't affect any influence and was totally subordinate to the wishes of democratically elected governments. You might notice there's an inconsistency in that argument. Never mind that the UK wasn't particularly stable during the reign of the Queen. It also didn't exactly leave behind its empire so much as transfer its empire to its new overlord. And it left behind a bloody legacy in these places. In fact, during the Queen's reign, there were concentration camps in Kenya which neatly brings me on to the final response that annoyed me about the Queen's death. <sighs> the YouTuber Lonerbox, who does pretty good videos, and I don't agree with them 100% of the time, but he has really nailed this softly spoken, nice, colourful lighting vibe of it, so I do kind of appreciate them, did a video about the British monarchy. And to be fair, his video is actually quite good, but I couldn't help but have this feeling that something was wrong with it. I watched it, I enjoyed most of it, but there was just something missing. And I realized what it was I thought happened. I felt like he missed the point. You see, the video is actually quite good at sticking to the facts of the monarchy and what it can and can't do, at least within the scope of a 26 minute video. So, you know, Fair play, good effort. At the very beginning, he says this series of largely correct things about what Queen Elizabeth did and didn't do. And I actually think, because I said they were largely correct, I actually think he was right about them. I don't think that Queen Elizabeth personally ordered the suppression of protests in Yemen. I also don't think she oversaw concentration camps in Kenya. I agree, I don't think she gave the orders and was personally involved in the execution of those things but it misses the point of what the institution is. And to be fair to him, he does do a good job of recovering from this mistake. It's just nagging at me. And I think it's nagging at me for a couple of particular and specific reasons. Firstly, even if we accept that the queen has no personal responsibility for the decisions made in her name, they were made in her name. And while the scope for her protest was correctly limited as an unelected monarch, and the people acting were often acting on the orders of democratically elected government, it doesn't change one crucial fact I want you to be ready for. You don't have to be a monarch. You can abdicate. In fact, the queen should be very, very aware of this fact because her Nazi uncle abdicated and gave the throne to her dad, who was the king's brother. The thing is, he didn't abdicate over the Nazi thing. He actually abdicated over the fact that he wanted to marry an American divorcee, which when you consider that Charles I got executed for, you know, effectively waging war against his own people, it seems like a rather minor reason to remove a monarch, if you ask me. The second reason is, I think of this incident where Charles is getting mad at a servant because they haven't moved like an ink pot or something. I'm still not 100% sure what it is, but it is a striking image. Why was this such a big deal? Well, if you take the monarchists at their word, it wasn't. The guy had just lost his mother and was under a lot of stress, to which I'd say this is literally the one thing he has to do for his job. And he knew it would probably come about like this. Either he's literally better than us than by virtue of birth and can handle this, or he's not. In which case, why is he there? I'm getting ahead of myself though. 
It's because all of this pomp and ceremony serves a purpose. It's to associate the individual monarch with the supposed stability and continuity of the institution of the monarchy. There's a common refrain among Republicans, which is that it's the institution, not the person. And when the Queen was alive, there was this common thing that was, we'll talk about it after she's died. And yeah, I kind of used to be one of those people. The thing is, the person is intimately tied to the institution itself. And so when we talk about it, we might have to talk about the person. That gives us a nice way into talking about the powers that the monarchy actually has. To be clear, we are not dealing with Charles I. Charles III cannot raise his royal standard over Nottingham and declare war on his own parliament, and he can't dismiss and summon it as he pleases. I might have a bit of respect for him if he did go full sicko mode and just try and do soul rule, but he can't and he won't. The position of king, I hope we'd all agree, is one of immense privilege. And I mean, after all, there's a reason the expression, it's good to be king, is one that exists in basically every single language that you can think of. And, look, and the reason it exists is because getting to live in opulence and be essentially unaccountable kind of rocks. Like, I would enjoy that, but I don't think I should have it just because of who I was born to. The thing about preserving that opulence and privilege, though, is that it's hard. And it's quite literally hard because it will involve hard power if you're an absolute monarch like Charles I. Why do that when you can have all of the benefits with none of the drawbacks? The British monarchy has immense soft power, power that we don't necessarily see or realize because it's kind of like asking whether a fish realizes it's in water. As an example of this power, let's take the issue of royal vetting of laws. See, the monarch gets to affix a nice pretty rubber stamp onto laws that makes them actual laws. And while if the monarch ever refused to do this at the request of a democratically elected government, it would lead to a very wild and very funny constitutional crisis, but it does mean that they get to vet those laws. Now, most of the time, this probably isn't a big deal. I mean, aside from the fact that an unelected head of state is vetting our laws, but we already have that in the form of the House of Lords. So really at this point, it's an additional outrage. But where it gets really outrageous, if you like, is when they start vetting laws that apply directly to them. So take this excerpt from this Guardian article. Some of the bills the Queen reviewed before they were passed to Parliament relate to wealth or taxation. One of the richest families in Britain, with the monarch's property investments exempt from inheritance tax and collections of fine arts and jewellery built up over centuries, the Windsors are notoriously guarded about their finances. Like, this matters, right? We have an incredibly wealthy family that is allowed inherently to vet laws that could relate to their wealth. And now, in the Guardian article, it says they interfered in four laws specifically, but that's four laws too many if they're an unelected political force. Then we have enforcement by the state. It may surprise you to know that while advocating for a republic is illegal, it's not really a law that's ever enforced directly. Let's take the case of a teacher in North Lanarkshire who pointed out to their class that it was strange that in the wake of the Queen's death that no dissenting voices were allowed prominent TV spots to talk about the monarchy as an institution and whether it should continue. What happened to that teacher? Well, let's see. A teacher at a secondary school in Scotland has been suspended after making inappropriate comments during a lesson about the royal family in the latest case of anti-republican repression following the death of Queen Elizabeth II. On Tuesday, North Lanarkshire Council suspended the teacher who was taught in the area for 22 years from Clyde Valley High School. After being informed of his suspension, the teacher was escorted off the premises due, he was told, to concerns for his safety. He requested anonymity for the same reason. Also, I would like to note that there is graffiti there that says Baz. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a good sign. <laughs>
If we replace some of the specific words of that article and we place that event in a country in say the Middle East or Africa and that country happened to have resources that America or Britain or whoever really wanted, they'd probably be gearing up to bomb the fuck out of that country. It's a, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but I don't think it's very much of one. Now, did Charles personally order the suspension of the teacher who made these comments about the monarchy? No, of course not. I don't, unless he's got even more spare time than he already has on his hands, I don't think he's doing that. But it was done in the name of the institution that he is the symbolic head of. So while I do subscribe to the it's the institution, not the person school of thought, generally, uh, well, it is the person because he lends legitimacy to it and props it up. It strikes me as bad that we invest this power into people who really only got their position because their ancestors were marginally more effective warlords than other warlords of the time and that happened to marry quite fortunately though they weren't the Habsburgs they were just as inbred. There are also the trite arguments about the cost of the royal family and it's not really an argument I'm terribly interested in because people tend to draw the lines about what is a cost of the royal family and what isn't and what money they bring in based on what's convenient to their arguments. But it's not actually the cost itself that I'm worried about. It's why we bother giving them the money in the first place. Do we give them a money to be a rubber stamp to lend the elected government of the day legitimacy? If so, why then could we not have an elected head of state do the same thing? If we instead are giving them money to lend legitimacy and provide cover for atrocities such as those concentration camps in Kenya that I mentioned earlier, well then, surely then it becomes a moral argument that we have to remove this institution because it's a moral stain on us all. How we should have reacted to the Queen's death is really just griping about the past. And what we should be doing now is focusing on how we make our case to people in the future. One of the big mistakes that we've made as modern Republicans in the UK is that we've not made it central to our politics, particularly those of us who are socialists. Look, part of the reason our politics is so rotten is because we still have a monarchy and we kept our aristocracy. And in a sense, the royalists of the Civil War era were kind of right. If we get the king, then we'll get the aristocracy too, and it will be well deserved. I'll explain a little more in the conclusion. Conclusions. At the end there, I really did hint at the core of the issue as far as I'm concerned. Is a monarchy compatible with my worldview, what I would want for this country and for the world? The answer is no. Now, I know there are meme accounts that go by like socialist monarchists, but come on now, it's not serious politics. Any serious emancipatory politics will need to reckon with all privileges, especially hereditary privilege. That means not just looking at the House of Lords, which has become almost uncontroversial as a thing that needs to be abolished among the kinds of people who are probably watching this video, but the monarchy itself. And yes, it's not going to be easy. I remember a time when we were at uni and I was, uh, it was a nice summer's evening and once the beer had been drunk, uh, a friend of mine became political. And yes, I mean a friend, not me, and decided to get onto the monarchy. And my friend's mum, who was there, just was generally just a really mild mannered, lovely person, just unloaded onto him. Now, this friend was from a republic, and so didn't think it was a big deal to want a republic. You'll be surprised to know I agreed with him, but the strength of feeling was intense and a little surprising. That's the kind of thing we need to be willing to reckon with, and I'm up for it. Are you? <sighs> on that note, I'd like to give it one more fuck the king, and I'll see you all on the next one. Uh, I need to thank my proofreaders, Mick Wright and my partner. I also need to thank the people who lent their lovely voices for the voiceovers. I, as of recording, don't know who they're going to be, but all of their stuff will be plugged in the description. I also need to thank my cameraman, Matt, 
who is known as AKA Matchstick on youtube.com and uh, whose partner runs a ferret rescue called Marley's Ferret Rescue. Is it something like that? Anyway, it'll all be in the description. Don't worry about it. It's all going to be in there. And I also need to thank my patrons, that is, and particularly my top tier patrons, Drone Rift, Mercutio, Kirsty Scheider, John N, and SMD. They're the top tier subscribers. They're the coolest people. If you want the videos a day early, you, at least one a month, uh, go down to the Patreon link in the link tree that will be down below. Otherwise, yeah, I'm out of here. And one more fuck the king. See ya, everyone.